Welcome back to the Globetrotters podcast, the show that brings you diverse storytelling, thoughtful discussions on ethical issues, and investigations into how you can make the most of an adventure without breaking the bank. I'm your host, Jonathan Otero. And I'm Maximil Gonzalez. Last week's episode featured another edition of our Layover series, our monthly travel show in which we investigate all things travel related, update you on the latest travel news, and occasionally we'll look into questionable travel trends so you don't have to. But on today's episode, we're speaking with Callie O'Connor. Callie is a career break and remote work coach for burnt out professionals. She's a recovering corporate addict who is addicted to the grind and praise of the corporate world which led to a self-induced spiral of stress. She decided to quit her job despite four promotions in three years and traveled the world for the next two and a half years. On her flight to Nairobi, she finally felt free and, quote, alive, and has helped working professionals find clarity ever since. Back in September 2021, she traveled throughout the United States. But what makes this adventure different from most is that she did so on the Amtrak train. For those that don't know, Amtrak offers train and coach transportation to 500 locations throughout the United States and uses 10 segments or routes to get there. Customers can purchase single, multi-ride, or a rail pass that covers 30 days. With her USA Rail Pass, Callie traveled long distances and explored large parts of the United States in a short amount of time. And today, we're going to find out what most of us are thinking. Why? Callie, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Callie, before we talk about your Amtrak trip, there's something on your website that caught my attention, and I was hoping you could speak on it a bit more. It reads, We are spoon-fed from childhood that the social norm is to go to college, get a job, work until 65 plus, retire, and then go on some sort of leisure travel. That sounds uninspiring, doesn't it? Well, friend, I have the powerful solution to reset your life. While I agree wholeheartedly with this statement, I want to ask, at what point in your life was the quote quote, true enough that you decided to take action? It was in the middle of my oil and gas career, or not the middle, I mean the end, it ended it, because I was feeling so much stress at work. I was working over 100 hours per week. And wow. like the one benefit of corporate world is paid vacation time, which was cool. And each time I took a paid vacation, I'd experience that dread of going back to work. Yeah. And at one point I'm like, I just want to be doing this. There are 197 countries in the world. There are three weeks of paid vacation per year. The math wasn't mathing. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, I need to do something and I need to do it quickly or else I'm going to have regrets when I'm older. Yeah. And three weeks, I feel like is being very generous. Usually it's two, right? Right. Like it's just not, it's too few for, especially it's a problem in the United States. So. Exactly. Yeah. And you said something that I think rings true for a lot of travelers or people that live or work in the corporate environment. Um, That dread that comes with having to return to the office after spending two weeks in Maui or Fiji or wherever they decide to vacation, right? Absolutely. And so, I mean, I've had both experiences where I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go home. But then Mm -hmm. this experience where I'm like, oh my gosh, I am actually really upset. I could cry at the thought of having to go back to the workforce (laughs) and like the office and stuff like that. So I knew it was time to make a change at that point. Totally relatable. Uh, Okay, so obviously you're very well-traveled, but this trip is very different uh, from most that we heard of. Back in September of 2021, you traveled through the United States on Amtrak. Uh, First question out of three, why? Uh, (laughs) Second one is how did you learn about this style of trip? Like what inspired you to take Amtrak? And have you done another trip like this before? Okay, so... (laughs) I might answer those out of order. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So where I don't know exactly where I had heard of it. I feel like years and years ago, I heard someone mention like so-and-so traveled across the United States on the train. And my initial thought was like, wow, that's ridiculous. (laughs) Who would do that? (laughs) And then I think it just sort of planted the seed. Yeah. (laughs) And it grew. And so 
at one point in 2020, I was in California. I needed to get back to Massachusetts. And I'm like, huh, what if I took the train? And I didn't do it at that point, which makes when you don't do something that you have an interest in, like the interest only grows. And so the seed was still there. And so come this point, I was living in Mexico. I was going to a wedding in California and my family is in Boston. And I'm like, huh, how can I do? Oh, and the Amtrak pass was on sale. So like the stars were aligning. I'm like, maybe this is the time, you know, I fly home to Boston. I take the train across the United States. I didn't, then I can book a flight back to Mexico from California. And so that's sort of how that idea was born. And mm -hmm. I forget the third question. <laughs> Uh, had you, had you done a similar type of trip before? I know Amtrak's very unique. And so, you know, some might compare it to doing like the EU rail in Europe. Correct. Um, but have you done another trip like this beforehand? Mm -hmm. Nothing to this scale. I think my longest previous train trip was an overnight train, both in Europe mm -hmm. and maybe India. Um, but mm -hmm. nothing that exceeded 24 hours. And we'll definitely ask you about some of those experiences later on and how they compared to your experience on the Amtrak. But you did bring up that the rail pass was on sale. So I want to talk a little bit about the cost before we dive into the experience. Uh, did it play any role in planning your adventure to California from Boston, which you know you said the discount did? But what were some of the financial advantages and disadvantages of traveling this way? And what did that pass actually include in terms of meals, accommodations? So the, the price wasn't the primary factor. Like my main motivation was the adventure. But yeah, if yeah. you were to consider transportation from Boston to California, one way flight is going to be at the very least $300. And the rail pass was on sale for $299, a $200 savings. And so, yeah. wow, that's a big savings, you know, really played into that. <laughs> um, and so the pass doubles as accommodation because you're sleeping on the train. So True. obviously if you flew, you wouldn't need any sort of overnight accommodation. I'm very aware of that, but you guys from adventure. Okay. So that's what we're right. Right. <laughs> um, we're with you. <laughs> feel that. And so that was the main motivation. And so, I mean, I had time. I wanted to experience some parts of the United States because as we mentioned, I have traveled quite extensively, but not so much in the US. So this felt like a good opportunity. And I just wanted to see some new cities and I planned it in such a way that I would be able to use points uh, to stay in hotels or whatnot. So I wasn't spending a ton on accommodation and during my stopovers. Yeah, speaking of savings, um, was this sale anything in particular or did the, the pass just happen to be on sale? It just happened to be on sale and it goes on sale intermittently. And yeah. so I've been mm -hmm. tracking it since before I took this trip and there's no rhyme or reason as to when it goes on sale. So I've seen it for $200 off. I've seen it for $100 off and it's various points throughout the year. Yeah. And, you know, I did do some a little bit of digging on the Amtrak site to see if right now it was on sale so we could go ahead and promote it for anyone that would be interested in doing this type of travel but something that i noticed that caught my attention is if you're a student there's like a standard 15 percent discount on any of the passes same thing for seniors and then there's specific routes within the amtrak uh, 10 routes that one of them could be on sale at any given time so they they do promote a lot of deals constantly and even when it's not on sale, it is a really good deal. So just to like give a little background as to what it is, you get 10 segments. So to find out what that looks like, I recommend going to the Amtrak website. But each time you get off the train, that ends your segment automatically. Some routes are multiple segments, usually because you have to change trains. But mm -hmm. you get 10 of these. So that's about $50 per segment. And some of the segments are very, very long. You could travel from Chicago to Seattle. If you choose not to get off, that is one segment, which is crazy. It's a pretty long segment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, like, that goes through quite a few states. Exactly. You could totally just circumnavigate the United States if you wanted to for a very reasonable price. So it's about putting in the effort to plan it in the way that you want to. So, I mean, I, it's great to have it on sale, but 
I didn't even use all my segments because I was able to get from point A to point B in just six. So really, there's a lot of opportunity to travel far distances for a really fair price. Yeah. Um, before booking your ticket, what were your accommodation offers or extras that Amtrak offered you uh, that were included or excluded? Did you have to pay for anything extra or was it kind of just a flat rate and you were sold? It's just a flat rate. They don't offer you anything. <laughs> they don't offer you to upgrade. There's nothing. So you just purchase it and that's it. You get a coach seat and you cannot hmm. even with this pass, there's no option to upgrade to the room at or the little suites that they have on board. Mm -hmm. But just out of curiosity, I did a little research on that. And to compare the price of a coach C to those roomettes and whatnot, it's just astronomical difference. So I decided mm -hmm. I could sleep in coach. Let's talk about the snacks or the meals and how you're planning for that. Um, I know they offer some services on board that you can purchase, but the train stop is also, or sorry, the Amtrak train is also stopping intermittently throughout these segments. How much of a break do you get that you can, let's say, walk to a grocery store, fill your bag with goodies, and then bring them back to the train? Because I'm assuming that's what you were doing. So I prepared before getting on the train. I brought everything that I would need so that I didn't have to get off. So when I did stop and I spent mm -hmm. time in locations overnight, that's when I would restock. But during the stops along the way, sometimes it was like, you have to jump off. Like if that's your stop, you have to be ready or you're not gonna get off and you're gonna continue the next right. stop. Other times they have like 15 minute, they call them smoke breaks. And maybe we could call them something else nowadays. I don't know, but, and then- Vape breaks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then I think the longest one was a crew change break, and that was about an hour. So that would have allowed enough time. But again, you really want to risk it in a city you're not familiar with, trying to go get snacks and groceries and stuff, and potentially your only ride is about to head out. So, Yeah. I've, I've taken the Amtrak um, a, a handful of times for rather shorter uh, segments, usually yeah. going from Sacramento to Oakland or Same. Richmond. Yeah, Richmond down to San Jose. Um and the stops that they have, like you said, the door is open for all of a minute, you know, 90 seconds, maybe. Uh, and so sometimes it is a rush. And I was just thinking if you were to try to hop off for an hour and go explore. For me, I'm paranoid. I'm not leaving my baggage on board by itself. You know, I'm bringing everything with me. So it sounds like a hassle. But the overnight stays sound great. Um, did you have days where or, uh, certain stops where you were there for multiple days or is it just usually one night and then hop back on? So I planned each of my stops to be two to three nights to just give me mm -hmm. that opportunity to sleep in a real bed, recover in the event that I wasn't able to sleep well in the coach seat the night before and mm -hmm. really get to explore and know the cities. So I stopped in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I stopped in Whitefish, Montana, and I stopped in Seattle, Washington. I have to ask, why? Why those cities? <laughs> it's a good question. And so this, like if you could see my brain during the planning phase, is where I like had the map out and I was doing all sorts of planning. And so the main criteria was like get from Boston to Napa, California for the wedding. And then I'm like, okay, the next step is I need to go to places that I haven't been before. And I would like to maximize the legs that I get in this past, which I clearly could have done a better job and used all 10, but it, it was like a balance of time and whatnot. And so there are three routes I could have gone. I could have taken a more Southern route. I could have gone like straight through the middle of the country, through the Rockies, or I could have done this Northern route. And so I think I ended up choosing the Northern route because that was an opportunity. Those were states like I hadn't explored at all. So it was really just an opportunity to see some new places i've traveled like by car through the middle of the country previously so i'm like yeah maybe that's sort of similar you know get to see the scenery and whatnot and i used to live in texas and so i'm like i don't need to go that way again i'm, hey. I'm good <laughs> i currently i currently live in texas so let's we're gonna Nothing totally cut with. that part <laughs> we're gonna totally you live cut in austin part. that's pretty much the bay area an extended bay area territory <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if I lived in Austin, it would be a different story. But I mean, I'm familiar with the state. And so yeah. also it was September. I'm like, I'm ready for some fall weather. I don't want to be super hot the whole time. So I went north 
And yeah. within the route, you can only stop where the train stops, of course. And so the train only goes once per day in each direction because of like the length of this journey. And so I mm. started looking at places I wanted to go and I realized I needed to time it properly. So when the train would arrive, for example, I was considering Fargo, North Dakota. I'm like, oh, that would be cool. But the train got in at 3 a.m. and it would also depart at 3 a.m., which would make it a little bit tricky logistically that I'm yeah. showing up in the middle of the night for in a new city that I don't know. I Would I have a hotel? Am I paying for a full night of hotel when I'm staying for when I'm arriving at 3 in the morning? And then I'm leaving right. at three in the morning. Like, do I just store my luggage and stay out all night? No, I'm 35, so no. Like, um, <laughs> so it was just a lot of logistics that went into that. And so that's sort of how I ended up making my decisions. So based on timing, based on places that interest me and the things that I wanted to be doing, which is mostly like outdoor activities and things like that. And I want to talk about those first two cities that you visited, because I think pe most people are very familiar with Seattle, Washington. The other two... There's got to be more, in my opinion, there's got to be more purpose to the trip if you're going to visit Milwaukee um, and the other city. Um, when we did our pre-interview, we talked about Milwaukee and maybe, thank you, Max Fargo. Um, when we, or was it Whitefish, Montana? Whitefish. 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 Oh. Ah, not listening, right. my friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But when we had our pre-interview, we talked about Milwaukee and we felt a little bit differently, but maybe <laughs> that decision we can attribute to weather and the time of the year that we went. I went in March, you went in August, September. Uh, so what is there to do in Milwaukee, Wisconsin that you would tell our listeners like, hey, it's worth checking out? So my favorite activity in Milwaukee is that you can kayak on the river and the river goes through the mm. city. So it's a way to sightsee from the water. And you like during this time of year, they were having concerts on the river. So like little barges or pontoons or whatever with bands on it. You can just like row and follow along cool. and you can dock your kayak and go to lunch and grab a beer and then get back in and continue your kayaking. So to me, that was like the most fun thing and the coolest way to see the city. And I'm like, there's a lot of cities that have rivers, but I've never done it. Like I've never done this. I've never been able to kayak and just like get out and then come back and it's still mm -hmm. there and like True. all these things. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a really unique thing. And then if you like beer, there's a lot of breweries. I mean, it's the home of Pabst and they have really yeah. interesting history tours and trying to think what else I did. Um, I went on a Jeffrey Dahmer walking tour, which was oh. interesting. It was before the Netflix show came out. So that was interesting as well. And like, it wasn't disrespectful in any way where like mm -hmm. there it's really to like honor the victims and stuff like that. And just like keep mm -hmm. them, their memory alive and things like that. So th that was cool too. You had me at kayaking. That, that sounds like a lot of fun. That's right she up had alley. she had me at Paps, <laughs> you know, but I, I I think I went on the Sam Adams tour or something like that when I was there. I, I can't really remember the brewery, but I also know like Budweiser and Bud Light and some of those um, have their uh, factories there in Milwaukee. So definitely a uh, pub town for sure, pub city mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but now moving on to Whitefish, Montana. But what would someone that's never heard of Montana, specifically Whitefish, because I think it's a smaller city compared to some of the other ones you could visit, um, made that an attractive destination? So, well, the train doesn't actually go through Montana's bigger cities. And for me, I'm a, I really like hiking. And what I wanted to do, it's pretty close to Glacier National Park, but the time of my trip was during like the rental car shortage and stuff like that. So it didn't mm. work out for me to be able to rent a car and go to Glacier, but it's such a cute little town and there's small hikes and stuff. So I was able to get around without a vehicle at all, walk to different hikes and just be outside. And like, it just feels fresh. I don't know how to describe it. It's just mm. nice. It's so different from living in the city and things like that. So I really enjoyed it. And also like small breweries and like small business ice cream shops, mom and pop places. It's cute and looks sort of like Western movie-esque in the downtown. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. it's different. 
you mentioned the option of driving across the U.S., and I've done that a couple times, and I know, especially on the 80, going through a number of states, it can get very lonely and boring, and you're kind of putting this mental energy forward to be alert and, you know, make, you know, quick decisions while you're driving. Amtrak's amazing because you're sitting there, you can read, you can nap, you can watch a show, you can look out the window, you can do all these things. Um, Did you have any reservations about booking this type of trip, like this trip in particular? Um, And if you didn't, what reservations did other people have when you spoke to them about this trip? So I didn't have any reservations just because like I'm very content being by myself and sitting for long periods yeah. of time. Like I'm just cool with it. I guess my only concern was I was working remotely part time, and I'm like, this is a long time to be on the train. I'm going to need to coordinate my working schedule um, because not all Amtrak trains have mm-hmm. Wi-Fi. And I didn't we, know that. Yeah, and the ones that do, it's not always the best, and like you can't hit dead zones. So I guess that was a slight reservation, but not reservation enough to hold me back. Other people are like, that's so boring. Like, what are you doing? Just fly. You're wasting so much time, but that's not how I right. see it. So to be able to look out the window, to be able to just be, mm-hmm. I love it. Like that's, I've traveled in like overland, not necessarily on a train, but extensively all over the world. And it's one of my favorite ways to see places. And I think both of you are alluring to this, uh, or sorry, alluding to this next point or question that I have. And I want to talk about the actual experience, because I think the way you're describing it, and it's fair to say this can be an easily romanticized um, version of, of travel. Um, On the one hand, you do get a lot of beautiful views along the ways and take a lot of time to self-reflect. But on the other hand, there's a lot of waiting and waiting Mm -hmm. and waiting to get to your next destination. So what are you doing in the, you know, what was the longest part that you had to stay in the train and what were you doing to, you know, either keep busy or keep your mind distracted or not distracted if you were just trying to zone out? So my longest leg that I was on the train was 30 hours. And yeah, most of it, it, it's really long. <laughs> but at that point, like, it didn't feel as long as it was. And so I, I, for me anyway, especially if I'm driving, if I'm in any sort of moving vehicle, it gets to a point where I'm like, I could keep doing this. Even flights. Like, I like long flights. I'm like, I could watch another movie. I could have another meal. Like, I'm totally fine with it. So as, like, the time passes, I'm like, I could do this longer and longer. Mm-hmm. I think not everyone is like me. But um, so, and the other thing is I can't read on the train. Like, it makes me a little bit nauseous. So mm-hmm. I really just looked out the window during the day. I listened to podcasts, and that was pretty much it. And I loved it. One thing we haven't talked about that's important to mention is this is September 2021. So COVID is still kind of at the heart of it, or at least there's a lot of restrictions in place. Um, Can you talk about that dynamic and how it impacted your experience as opposed to someone who maybe is traveling, let's say today, and there are no restrictions in terms of seating the people you're encountering? So I think it was totally a positive because the trains were not completely full, which meant that almost 100% of the time I had the seat next to me available, which was perfect for sleeping because I just contorted myself into a small ball and fell asleep. And so somebody sent me a message and said, that's really bad. And I could have like a heart attack or something or like a a (laughs) blood clot stroke. I don't know, but... I survived. Anyway, so maybe don't do that. Maybe just sit in your seat. Um, but that is what I did. Also, masks were required on the train, and they like came up and down checking. And if you didn't have yours on, you would be folded and then removed from the train. So that was, I mean, it was at that point where I'm like, I'm so glad everyone's still wearing masks. It felt safer. And so it was just a good experience, not too busy. And yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing we haven't covered on this show, but we really should, is there's been a rise in violence against flight attendants, you know, since COVID started. And even to today, that number is still kind of holding up pretty high. Did you encounter any of that on the train when people were trying to enforce uh, the mask mandate? Just because, you know, you are traveling through some, let's say, states where it wasn't necessarily enforced. Definitely. So I didn't. 
see any major issues. There's like one instance I remember that there were two girls that were asked to put their masks on. They didn't. They were asked again. And then like the one of the conductors came on over the intercom and said, we threw two people off the train yesterday and we won't hesitate to do it again. And so then they put it on and it was all fine. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was a law at the time. So and I think it's a lot easier on a train than in the air. <laughs> yeah. If you purchase the USA Rail Pass, I definitely recommend, especially nowadays, planning your route and then booking all of the segments mm -hmm. in advance to make sure that you're not going to get stuck anywhere. And then it could just throw off all of your plans, especially if you have somewhere to be or you need to get back. And so actually, I don't think I've mentioned this at all before, but originally instead of Seattle, I was going to go to Portland mm -hmm. and I decided to change it. I booked it already. It was all set. And then I made a last minute switch. So you can always book and then change it. So that's also good to know. You're not locked in. If As long as there's availability, you can do it for free. Yeah, you mentioned um, being able to change your stops and the flexibility there. Uh, I'm kind of relating this to the EU Rail Pass, where it's just a pass where the majority of the trains and destinations you can, you know, you can hop on and take most trains without having to pay for an extra reservation, which can be anywhere from, you know, two to 12 euro, sometimes 30 but it's still, you know, cheaper than just buying one ticket after one ticket. With the Amtrak pass, uh, do you have to choose your destinations ahead of time? Or is it like you have the pass and it's good for 10, they punch one once you get off? How You have to choose. You have to so choose, So okay. you have to have a ticket for the route that you're on. Gotcha. So they'll come by and check just like normal if you were to buy a single leg. And so it needs to match up. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and then in terms of the comfort level, uh, I think that's really important that you kind of, uh, you know, that you brought, you brought up the chair and the seating. Um, I think they're pretty comfortable, but I'm trying to put myself in that position and sleeping overnight in them might be a little tough for me. But I think that's really important to note that these aren't, you know, lazy boy reclining back chairs just want to. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Um, how often were you traveling with someone for large portions of the trip? I know it was during COVID, so you most of the time had a seat next to you open. Uh, were people swapping out constantly? Are there any like specific characters that you like that are that you wanted to note or that kind of made an impact on you for this trip? So, people. Like people use it as regular transportation. So people would be traveling on the Amtrak for an hour on the same train that I'm traveling on for 30 hours. So it's really an interesting dynamic. Like everyone's there for different reasons. Right. And so just one noteworthy story, and I don't know how to pronounce the name of the town, but we had a longer stopover for a crew change in North Dakota somewhere. And so I got off the train, I went to a little coffee shop nearby and other people had the same plan. And that's where I sort of encountered other people on long train trips as that's well. Cool. So in North Dakota in the line who thought we were all insane and it was just a cool experience to sort of integrate in that moment. <laughs> I know one of the cars, there's a bar, right? Isn't there like a, a dining area and a bar in one of the cars usually? So the dining car is dedicated to people with like room oh, reservations. Of course. Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask if you were, uh, you know, hanging out at the bar and meeting other people who were on for long periods of time, but it sounds like you would have to meet those people off during a longer stop at a coffee shop or yeah. Cool. Exactly. And, and you know, that is kind of an interesting uh, observation, I guess, that some people are hopping in after an hour because you could almost compare it to when you're traveling internationally or just even to another flight. Some people might be on the third or fourth leg of their trip traveling for 20, 24 hours, and you're all fresh, you know, getting into a two hour leg flight. So, um, for anyone listening, it's always that's why I always preach like patience and like you don't know what someone else is going through. They could be traveling for you know, happy reason, sad reason, and just give people their space. And exactly. Um, how would you compare your experiences uh, on this train with ones abroad? Did you take many trains uh, abroad? And would this be very different compared to those or rather similar? It's it is very different because in overnight trains, it's in other countries, it's affordable to get like, you know, those little benches or whatever, something to sleep on, something that you can lie flat. And it's just not affordable in the United States to purchase that. So that is a major difference. And I feel like 
maybe in India, like they bring you food, they bring you snacks, nothing's included on the Amtrak. So it's not a full service train. Mm -hmm. It's just, you're kind of off doing your own thing. So it's good and bad. It depends on how you like to travel. And I'm, I'm here for both of them. So cool. You know, to the best of your ability, what could you have done differently that would have given you a more enjoyable experience from what you already had? Because it sounds like it went pretty good f overall. Yes, it was definitely good overall. I think maybe I, I was a little cold. I would have brought some more comfort items. I just didn't want to be carrying so many things. So it there's a balance there. And I think I would have tried to use all of my segments just to really max mm -hmm. out the experience. I feel you there. I feel like sometimes over planning is good, even though that's not my style at all. But just making sure that you get the best uh, bang for the buck is the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, would you travel this way again? Or would you take the car ride or flight next time you have to get across the US? <laughs> It depends. I would definitely travel this way again. I would choose a different route. Mm -hmm. I would try different cities, but it's a fun adventure. And the cool thing on the Amtrak website, like it tells you how booked up the trains mm -hmm. are. So I would try to like cater it to not a full train because mm -hmm. it was nice to have the space. So the best you can. They always tell you like, you've got one seat per person. Don't put your stuff on the other seat, whatever. But they were more lax about those rules at nighttime. So you were allowed to kind of. Right scooch over into the other seat but like the train stops in the middle of the night people can get on in the middle of the night so that is also something to consider yeah. Callie before we let you go we want to discuss some of the resources you provide travelers we mentioned you're a career break and remote work coach what does that mean and how did you get involved and how, how are you interacting with people and helping them achieve this uh, this career break sure so this I mean, came about because as we mentioned at the beginning, I was stressed at my corporate job. I ended up quitting and traveling around the world for two and a half years. And to me, that was the best decision I could have made. And it was really cool to have that opportunity to really see the world without having adult responsibilities. I think everyone should experience that at least once. It's incredible. So I've developed courses around this to help people with planning because I mean, as we've discussed throughout this episode, like, I guess I'm a planner. And so there, a lot goes into quitting your job and planning around the world trip. And to be honest, when I did it, I made a ton of mistakes. And there are so many things I would have done differently. And it would have saved me a lot of time. And it would have saved me a lot of money. And my goal is to help people with that upfront. So they're not wasting time and money because both of those are very valuable. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of transition, transitioned into the remote work thing. I found that a lot of people aren't quite ready just to quit everything and travel and that they feel that they need a source of income. So I've been helping people find remote jobs, really making people aware that there are multiple ways that you can work remotely. You don't just have to work for full time for an employer, that you can freelance, that you can sort of start your own thing, that you can do part time jobs so that it fits your desired lifestyle and not you just find a job that's remote so that you can travel because ultimately that usually doesn't work out in the long run because it's you're still dedicating all of your time to this job that might be really stressful and you just happen to be in a really cool place that you can't fully enjoy because you're working. And just a quick follow-up question to that. If it's not too intrusive, uh, has most of your clientele been like a specific age demographic, like 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 plus? Definitely 30s and up. Interesting. Um, well, Callie, thank you so much. Before we let you go, we got a few rapid fire questions My for you. My favorite part of the Are show. Ready? Let's go. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Callie, what's been your favorite country to visit so far? I'm sure you both know this is like the hardest question you can ask someone, but Mexico is because I've lived there because I've spent the most time there. It is just somewhere that's really special to me. And I'm not talking like Cancun. I'm talking the mainland Mexico. And there's so much to see there that I think is really underrated. Y como está tu español? <laughs> Bastante bien. <laughs> okay, cool. Good job. Uh, next question. What's been your favorite dish abroad? Oh, my goodness. 
like so I love to eat. That's like my favorite thing. So my most recent trip abroad was to Sri Lanka. So we'll just stick with that theme and it's called Kotu. And mm. if you're not familiar, it's like chopped up roti like the tortilla type things and then it's like mixed with curry and it sometimes they put cheese in it like basically laughing cow triangles and it's just so delicious i'm so hungry you see max this is why i love this segment you just learn so much that cool that that is now part of my list of foods to try or <laughs> cuisines uh, next one callie favorite beverage abroad alcoholic or otherwise Again, so difficult. We'll go back. So since I lived in Oaxaca for about a year, I'll say Mezcal. Mm. And I just yeah. I love it. Let's go. There we go. Uh, the country you want to visit the most? Madagascar. Okay. That's a Interesting first, yeah. one. No, no one yeah. said that one yet. No one said okay. that one yet. <laughs> and for this last one, I'll give you some time to think about it if you need it, or maybe it's going to come right off the cuff. Your favorite travel adventure so far, and it can't be this one. Okay. Even if it is. <laughs> it, I mean, this is a pretty good one. And so based on my answer, you'll see like I have a little bit of a thing for transportation. But when I was in Sri Lanka this May, I rented a tuk-tuk and I drove myself around the island for the whole month. And that was... I think that is something that pushed me out of my comfort zone the furthest in my travels, and it was so fun, and I highly recommend it. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Uh, if our listeners want to learn a little bit more about you, where can they find you? You can find me on Instagram and TikTok at the, the Travel Shifters, mm -hmm. and my website is travelshifters.com. Awesome. Uh, Callie, it was great to have you on the show. Um, yeah, I loved your story, definitely. and I honestly, John, we should look into doing a uh, a remote. I know, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, we should just thing. do like li live recordings throughout the U.S. Just do a huge circle and just do it on Amtrak. I think that'd be fantastic. That's what I was yeah. thinking too. Uh, Callie, thanks again for being on the show and sharing your story. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, to all of our listeners, if you want to find out a little more about us, you can visit our website at www.gtspodcast.com. You can find us on Instagram or Facebook at Globetrotters Podcast, on Twitter at Globetrot Pod. Make sure you drop us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, if you enjoy listening to the conversation. Uh, and don't forget to reach out to us if you have any ideas for future episodes or just want to stop by and say hi. You can email us at hello at gtspodcast.com. Editing on this episode was done by our very own Jonathan Ortero. Thanks for listening. Until next time.